the second month, we did 500K in sales. Nice. Uh, using Facebook video ads. Wow. And at that point, I became pretty obsessed with like Facebook video ads and how those work. That's pretty early because no one is really picking up on video ads. That was like right point. when video ads came out. We spent $2,000 to do $500,000 in sales. Like wow. that's not going to happen again. Wow. That was a magical time. Yeah. This episode of the Bloomex podcast is brought to you by Nava Wilson LLP. Nava Wilson LLP provides services in real estate, corporate law, and litigation, and is committed to increasing access to and awareness of the justice system. Nava Wilson is also the legal advisor for YSpace, York University's incubator, and The Hub, the University of Toronto Scarborough campus's incubator. They are willing to provide up to $5,000 worth of services to a select few startups in Toronto. If you're a startup looking for access to legal services, contact us at the link below to find out more. And we're on. Awesome. Okay. Um, Michael, thank you for joining us. Um, you're someone I was like, really excited to have on. Uh, you got quite a few startups under your belt and um, had a few successes along the way. Uh, let's dive right into that. All right. So you grew up on the south side of Chicago, yep. right? You decided to come to Queen's University. That's your first taste of Toronto. That's right. Right. And uh, you ended up starting a company there that uh, ended up doing pretty well. Yeah. Right. At least you did pretty well with that. Um, so let's dive into that. Um, how was growing up in Chicago? South side, right? Yeah, south side. So it's a little different than Toronto. And I think it's like hard to explain and consider in comparison. Uh, but I think it was a good community to learn about. Like lots of entrepreneurs, small business people around. Uh, and it's an intense environment. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think it's, uh, it's a good place to build a foundation in terms of that. But seeing a lot of different places is important. So I actually grew up in Chicago. I was born in Alabama. Okay. My family's in Omaha, Nebraska now. I moved to wow. Connecticut halfway through high school. Uh, so I've seen a lot of different locations. And I think as that ties back to like starting a company, you got to think about who are the different audiences you're going after. You know, for most people, they're targeting the entire U.S. And like, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Something I tell a lot of Canadians is like, go on a road trip and go to somewhere besides Miami, <laughs> go to somewhere besides New York, besides LA, like every Canadian's been there. But what do you know about Cedar Rapids? Like, what do you, what do you know about Boise, Idaho? Nothing. Yeah, right. And so we did a lot of road trips too growing up. And I think yeah. going and seeing all these different places, the way different people live is like an amazing way to start to frame product market fit. Definitely. So uh, that definitely influenced the way you created products uh, later in life? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think it's... Uh, you know, an easy mistake to for people to create something that's sexy for people who are around them. Yeah. Right. Like there's the startup that every entrepreneur loves, and usually it's a premium product or like a smart device or a tool that people would use. Uh, but the majority of people aren't entrepreneurs. The majority of people aren't in tech. So that first project I worked on uh, was called Snapsaves, and it was a grocery coupon app. Snap saves. Snap saves. Okay. And this is the one that was acquired by Groupon later was, on. Was acquired by Groupon later on. And this is after Queens? You so I was actually at Queens for a couple of years. I met uh, Michelle Romano's business partner. His name's Anatoly. Uh, they've been doing businesses for like 10 years together. Uh, I met him at an event. He saw me pitch. Within five minutes of meeting me, he offered me a job. Nice. So it was like, for sure, I'll take the job. Uh, so you pitched your business idea? Or? So it was like a business pitching competition. Okay. He met me there. I uh, said, okay, I'll, I'll give you this job within five minutes of meeting me. Uh, once he left the conference, he gave me a, a card. I emailed him on Monday, like, can't wait to follow up on this job. Looking forward to scheduling it. No response. Oh, no. So emailed him again, emailed again, started yeah. to email him all the time. Uh, found the phone number, started to call him every day and email him every day. Found him on LinkedIn, started a LinkedIn message, call and email every day. Because I didn't want to go back to Omaha, Nebraska for the summer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, eventually added him on Facebook, messaged him on Facebook. He's like, you're persistent enough. You got the job. <laughs> Show up on this date this time. Nice. Okay. Uh, yeah. Started as an intern. They had like three different companies going. Snapstays was one of them. Uh, and then I ended up basically running that project and becoming COO. Okay. Uh, we grew that and sold that in 11 months. To wow. Um, can you talk about how much you sold for? Can't. Can't. Okay. Wish I could. Yeah. Wish for I the company, Jolly. Those, yeah. I was looking it up and there was, like, usually anytime there's an acquisition deal, People right. brag about that. Right. Definitely, right? It's part of, part of the bragging rights. So I was really surprised it wasn't. It's part of, the, part of the agreement with Groupon? Part of the agreement with Groupon. A little okay. different there, but... Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so what, is, what was Snap Saves and what, were you try, what problem were you trying to solve? Yeah, so it was a, it was a grocery coupon app. So uh, it was taking grocery coupons and putting them on your phone. And this sort of transitions into the way I think about so much now of uh, the history there has been mail-to-home coupons. 
right? So mail to home, a company writes a big check, mails out a ton of different coupons, and that's it. They don't know what gets redeemed. They don't know what happens there. Uh, the industry had moved to to printed home coupons. So they knew there was a, a click at home or they knew there was a print, but they didn't know if they were redeemed. We would have them take a picture of their grocery receipt and we know if they were re redeemed or not and start to build accountability and tracking and attribution into the grocery coupon market. So this was, so this is still, um, you're targeting the people that were sending um, coupons to people's houses? To people's houses. So like, you know, by the time we sold Snap Saves, we had every major Canadian CPG on board. So I stepped into sales there too, and our sales team was like four of us. It was Michelle, Anatoly, guy, Dan Warner, who's now a multiple-time entrepreneur and myself. And we closed every major CPG between the U.S. and Canada. So that's Coca-Cola, Pepsi, P&G. Like, if you're in the sales world, you know those are hard contracts to get. And then when we moved to Groupon, we got all of the American counterparts as well. So Michelle Romano's partner brought you on as an employee for Snap, for Snap, Snap Saves. And then and Michelle mentored me through that whole period. I actually lived on her couch for a while. Nice. Like, she, she's like family now, but uh, wow. we, uh, yeah, we, we all got that started together. That's great. So this is one of your first jobs. You're pretty young at this time. I was 19. 19. Yeah. And you became CEO. CEO. And Chief Operations Officer. Yep. And we sold when I was 20. Jeez. And then I was managing 120 people in the customer service division when I was 20. So how, how did that happen? How did the 19-year-old become a CEO of a company with these kind of names behind them? Yeah, so I think I was super lucky to have these mentors, but I also like invested the time into it. Uh, you know, I would stay and show up before they did and left after they did. And I would finish the work I had and always say, okay, what can I do to help? Nice. And it's like, it's one thing to say that at 5 p.m. It's another thing when it's 2 in the morning, you're still at the office, you're expected to be there at 9 a.m. the next day, and you're like, okay, what can I do next? And they're like, holy shit, this kid's pushing it. Nice. We're going to give him some more opportunity. And eventually, you know, in a startup, there's only so much bottom level work. Yeah. So as I kept finishing all the work and finishing all the work, it, what I was doing was stepping up and stepping up. Nice. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's great. I mean, that hustle mentality at such a young age. I mean, most people are looking for like, okay, my, this is my job. I get paid. Now I'm trying to go out, trying to meet some girls, trying to go to the bar, right? Um, there was no social life at this, at this time for you? you no was social like, life. You saw an opportunity and you're like, I want to double down on this. Absolutely. I mean, it was like 18 hours a day, seven days a week. Usually had an all-nighter in there. Like, like, literally would have times when I was like, what, didn't go home over the weekend or had gone home for six hours over the entire weekend. It was just pushing through it. And yeah. that was like, we sold in 11 months. Like, that's fucking fast for a yeah. startup. Yeah, absolutely. So what was the motivation factor here? You saw the growth potential, you saw the name behind it, you saw the opportunity basis, and you're like, I want to go all in on this, or what, what motivated you to be like? Yeah, so I think I was almost failing out of school at the time. Yeah. Uh, I hated school. I didn't want to go back there, and you know, Michelle Romano, that was sort of the company that put her on the map as Michelle Romano. Yeah, so yeah. It wasn't even the names then, it was uh, this opportunity to go like, okay, I've got a chance here. I'm going to put everything behind it and like, I'm going to turn this into something. This has to be something. I can't go back to where I was. I can't go back to school. I'm not going back to Omaha, Nebraska. <laughs> I'm selling this company. You know, we're making sure this company sells and I'm going to do whatever it takes to make that happen. That's great. So your background of how you grew up and, and where you came from really kind of strove you to be like, okay, I need to, I need to close. I need to move better in life. Totally. That's amazing. So in Queens, you took physics? You're so I started in physics, fell out of physics, moved to philosophy. Nice. Yeah. And then your second year, you're like, um, it's not going to go anywhere. Yeah, I was in philosophy. And like, you know, the great thing about Queens and university, and I don't tell people not to go to university, yeah. is you build a great network. So my co-founder on Acquire Now, I met at Queens. And I met Michelle's partner through Queens. So met a lot of people. I did a lot more networking, <laughs> which is also like more partying and networking yep. than, than academics, but it, it paid off in the long run. It was hilarious. So I do a lot of the talks now with the high school and the university crowds, and you see the lack of social skills in these kids, totally. right? I mean, there's no parties in universities anymore. Right. Back in the day, it used to be, it used to be you know, university. It's, a, it's, it's supposed to be a wild time. Yeah. Nowadays, everyone has like Netflix parties with like a few <laughs> friends who like hang out on a couch, right? Yeah. But there's, no, there's one less opportunity for these kind of social gatherings, right? Like, how, how, do the, how do those social kind of skills kind of like translate into success for you? Did it help you at all? Absolutely. Like, that's what gives you confidence, I think. When you put yourself on the spot, that's like practice rounds. Yep. And here's the real thing. Like, I'm on a podcast. I got to be ready to go. You got to show up and yep. like be ready to embrace people and, and bring that around. And sales is, is such a big part. And like the social part is such a big part of what you have to do. The other part's hard work for me. You know, I'm not an engineer. Like if you're an engineer and your social skills aren't the best, you can get by. 
But yeah. if you're not going to be an engineer, your, your social skills better be really on point. No, absolutely. And so, another place, yeah, another place I learned that and was part of the work ethic motivation was working in a mechanic shop in high school. Oh, yeah. And I worked for a guy who was like an illegal immigrant. He was my boss and he used to boss me around like crazy. Yeah. And they had me working 12 hours a day, seven days a week because I could just take the shifts. I just kept taking them. Um, and that's the same thing of like learning that process, learning that work ethic. Yeah. And sort of knowing you can like apply that and seeing when I really apply myself, like things can, you can change your position. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's so important like at an early stage in life to have that high pressure, high demand kind of, kind of tasks because yeah. that translates so much into your ethic early on. It gives ingrained to you that like, this is how, how I have to be pushing it all the time. That's your baseline. Absolutely. So everything else is like either above or below it is not acceptable. Um, that's great. So you're, at, you're 19. All right, you start with this company. Um, what were the problems that the company's facing that you're solving? Like, well, what was your ad value there? Yeah, so I mean, we started from scratch. Uh, and I mean, this is like AI is a thing now. Uh, but at the time we were Sorry, trying what, to- what year was this around? This was 2013. 2013. So at the time we were trying to read receipts. OCR wasn't fully there. So when they talk about all the hard work that has to go into building OCR, like I did a lot of that hard work where I personally read like 60,000 receipts. Like I had a team that in the OCR end, OCR is optical recognition. Optical, uh, got optical camera recognition. So camera recognition. Uh, recognizing what an image is, like, like the barcodes and all that. Uh, the UPCs, so like what is, what do those words mean? Okay. And even just getting the cam the camera to be able to read that text because it's a different font. So getting to train it on that font, uh, you know, we were typing up like hundreds of thousands of receipts. Oh wow. And and going through that process, uh, figuring out like deterring fraud there building the operation, doing the product management side, and then uh, I got heavily involved in the marketing side as well. So that was customer acquisition, which is translated to sort of where my path has led and where yeah. I found uh, my greatest skills and where I actually like, liked it. Because operationally, like, yeah, I could read receipts and I could push myself through it. I didn't love that. I loved uh, running ads and getting people to, uh, to buy things or to download an app. So what did your strategies learn there? Like, what are you, what are you employing at the time? As a 19-year-old and trying to go to marketing, was it because your age and you saw new shifts in the environment and uh, tools work that uh, really draw, like, gave you that kind of opportunity to like, think differently? Yeah, I think you know, Google's a big friend, but I also had mentors who like, showed me the path, took some risk on me, allowed me to push it, and I think I had places where I was just adept and I could just like, start it, and I kept finding success and finding success when I would try things. Like, I'd pick up a, a phone and make a sales call and I was good at it, or like, do marketing and I was good at it. And then I'd have to hit the places where like, oh, I'm really not good at that. Like, my first business model I had to build was a disaster. Like, it was the <laughs> ugliest thing you've ever seen. Uh, so it's learning where your skills are and where they aren't and like, where you have some natural abilities and where you don't. Uh, and I naturally had ability to write persuasively, uh, naturally had ability to speak persuasively, uh, did not have natural ability at finance, and so had to like dig in on that area. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so Groupon, right? You got acquired by Groupon within a year, yep. right? Um, they forced you to move to so Chicago. To move to Chicago, back which to was Chicago. like, for me, for everyone on the team, like, yes, this is this new experience. I'm like, no, I'm getting sucked <laughs> back to Chicago. I was trying to go on my big adventure. Yeah, yeah. Now I'm headed back. Uh, so back to Chicago, I was the first one to move there, so I was leading the uh, onboarding for the first six months. So I was like hiding my age so hard. So my coworkers would invite me to go out drinking mm. and I'd have to be like, uh, no, I can't, I'm going to the gym. And that was my like every time excuse of like, I'm going to the gym. And yeah, if yeah. you're not just listening, if you're watching, like clearly I was not going to the gym that <laughs> frequently. <laughs> so because you got acquired, um, you got like, a senior position within Groupon? So I was like a semi-senior, but because I was the first one there, I was leading a lot of the senior initiatives, uh, meeting with the CMO, meeting with uh, the head of legal, like. I really wanted to run contests and they wouldn't let me. So I was like literally after work going home and reading all the contest laws and coming in to the general counsel at Groupon and like yeah. negotiating with them on terms of what we could run, uh, setting up like a 120 person sales team, uh, setting up a launch where we were spending millions of dollars on ads. That's great. And you're like, what, 21 at the time? 20. Still, 20, and then 20. turn 21 like right after we launched. Okay, and finally you can go back to the bar. You yeah, go to the bars. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah, what was the, sorry, yeah, go ahead. No, no, please. What was the experience like at Groupon? Like, I, I, it was a much bigger company. Yeah, I mean, it was a 10,000 person company. First uh, corporate job. First corporate job. Like, I have no right being there. <laughs> I yeah. have no idea how I'm supposed to be there. Yeah. I'm trying to figure out how to act. And just like looking back, I had so much ambition and like so much like just gall. Like I would just go do things. Like I didn't have a conscience in terms, I didn't even know like what was high level at that time. Mm -hmm. So if it was like 
you know, going and negotiating with the CMO to secure budget. Like, I didn't know that that was a high level thing. I didn't understand the differences. So I would yeah. just go do everything and treat everything the same way, the low level task and the high level task. Uh, and it was just kind of fearless out of ignorance. Yeah. Uh, and was able to navigate pretty well there. But like I did the first all-nighter I think had ever happened in that office there, and people were like, Who is dude, this guy? stop, yeah. stop, <laughs> stop, please, please. You are setting a bar we, we don't want here. <laughs> go home, go work, like, work down to five. Yeah, yeah. And I think that was tough for me because I was still in such a going, going mode, yep. and definitely the attitude in, in corporate is like, don't. We, we don't slow down slow down like, we don't stay like in your that. lane like, stay right. in your lane yeah. and i definitely had a lot of places where i was like going outside of my lane uh some of it was well received some of it not so much uh but i think you know we i pushed really hard through that period and we had the most successful launch groupon had ever had on a product uh, we got over a million downloads in a week we had hundreds of thousands of coupons redeemed it was uh it was so snap deal became a segment of groupon or a so it became also? uh it was sort of just Slap and snap by Groupon and that coupon service, uh, and then having access like the Groupon customer. Okay, so uh, how many how many employees were at Snapdeal with you, and how many of them joined you at Groupon? Gosh, I think it was eleven who were at Snap. Okay, so it was a pretty relatively small. Yeah, and then like ten of before. them, ten of them joined. Ten of them joined. Yeah, but Michelle and uh, they have partnered did not. No, they did. They did. They did. So they oh, okay. they moved to Chicago as well. Oh wow! So, so yeah, what, so we all moved to Chicago. We were all hanging out in Chicago. Amazing. So what was their role there? So Michelle and Anatoly came on and they were leading the sales in the beginning and then sort of they moved to Chicago, switched more to operations and I switched over to sales. And sales, okay. So from sales, how did you get into marketing? Uh, so I was doing the marketing for the launch yeah. and managing sort of multi-million dollar budgets there and then moved on and did, uh, did the sales piece where that was customizing and selling in the program that would make sense for the CPGs. So you were, you were at Groupon until 2015? 2015. 2015. And yeah, I mean, it was a crazy time moving into sales. Like, I went and spoke at the uh, Coca-Cola, it's like the, the uh, manager's meeting, so it's got all the VPs on from uh, globally, it's got everyone on, and we're talking about the coupon strategy and what's happening with mobile and digital coupons. And like literally two years ago, my job before that was I was merchandising for Coca-Cola in Omaha, Nebraska, which is like literally picking up boxes and putting them on the shelves. Jeez. Two years later, I'm there talking in front of like the president of Coca-Cola in terms of- What a of, climb, right? Yeah, it was. An insane climb. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things you got to love about the innovation economy, right? When you have the ability to like exponentially grow, not just yourself, but um, your abilities. Right. Um, because if you target the right pain points and you have the right solution, I mean, Absolutely. I mean, the only thing stopping you is to drive. And you clearly have that, yeah. And I think, you know, I respect my mentors and I like tell kids, go find a mentor. If you want to drop out, don't just drop out of school because you think you're brilliant. Like, if you find a brilliant mentor, drop out of school to work for them. Absolutely. Uh, but we were able to take the history of one area, which is sort of digital, mobile, acquisition focused, uh, looking at these ways of marketing, and bring it to a new industry. And now we've got more expertise in that area than there is in the, you know, in the entire field. Mm -hmm. So in terms of finding an area of expertise and relying on that to drive you forward, like that's, that's so important. And you see that across different areas. Like Uber didn't know more about taxis, right? We didn't know more about grocery coupons in the grocery coupon market did, but we knew more about the style of marketing, uh, which so was- what, what was that style of marketing? So that's acquisition marketing, and that's sort of the startup marketing mentality, and there's not even a full name for it entirely, but it's, it's when you have things that are tracked, when you are spending dollars on a slow basis, so instead of dropping money in a big way, drop rolling out in a small way and running lots and lots of tests. Targeting. Targeting and tracking, right? Like the biggest obstacle when we were selling was not that we didn't have the technology or we couldn't do the tracking. It's that executives at CPGs didn't want the tracking. Mm. They don't want a report card. They've never had a report card, right? So if you lay out sort of where the marketing field has been for so long, it's uh, buy a billboard and you're done. <laughs> buy a TV ad and you're done. And in terms of results, like you're not really tracking your results. What do you measure yourselves on? Like awards, which is a peer based measurement, which really isn't attached to anything. Right, and, and I run ads all the time now, and I, if you line up 10 ads, I'm not gonna pick which one is the best every single time. That's, that's really interesting, because uh, I don't think most people have uh, understood the, how, how different targeted ads has changed the environment. Absolutely. Um, so what's the biggest change you've noticed? Like, you, you work with these brands, and I mean, did people lose their skill sets they've had, which is essentially run broad, broad screen advertising? Well, advertising when you look at where the market stands today, like. 
there is the old and the new, just like there's taxis and there's Uber. Yep. Like people are still buying billboards. They're still buying TV ads. They're, they're still buying things kind of with, with no purpose and it's brand marketing. Mm-hmm. And, and I like completely don't believe in that. And we're going to get to where I am today because my company now is based on my non-belief of that. And I think a lot of that's based on corporate executives who don't want that report card. Uh, when you work on the acquisition side, so I think if you look at sort of the lineage of where marketing went, you got the billboards, then there was a traffic era where you're tracking how much traffic do you have to your site, how much traffic is there. And that was like what you could do at the time. And now we really have this conversions. Like we can actually track to the purchase. We can track to the download. Yep. We can track to the end result. We can track to someone using the coupon. Uh, and that is the future of marketing. And it's like happening at the same time as there's still billboards out there. Absolutely. And I mean, it's a proven track record of like targeted ads. So th- there's a huge debate about this right now, right? right? Um, I forgot who uh, launched this, but it was a big, a big media article that came out claiming that targeted ads, there's no, there's no systematic reason that targeted ads is more beneficial than broad-based ads or non-targeted ads. Um, where would you... I, I, yeah, that's, that's not true. But I think first what we're talking about is attributed ads, right? Okay. So tracked ads. Yeah. Results tracked. And like, that seems like a no-brainer. If you don't work in marketing, you're like, well, of course they have to track the results. Like, no, there's the bigger percentage of marketing right now does not have results tracked from it, <laughs> right? So the smaller percentage is actually results tracked ads. In terms of targeting versus broad, there's cases for both. So when it came to sales, so I mean, I, I was in technology sales, studying technology, technology outsourcing solutions, right? And we initially started targeting CTOs, uh, chief technology officers of, of like uh, of bigger brands. And we're telling them, it's like, hey, yeah, you know, instead of hiring this programmer for like 70,000, five of them, right? right put like half of this way and we can outsource and get it done for you in half the time. Uh, they weren't happy about that, right? Because right? they had their own sided way of doing it. And if they're going to outsource it, they had their own firms and their own friends and their own relationships they have had. Um, and that became a big, a big barrier. Right. Um, literally even in the health industry, I found. Um, the CTOs of, of major health clinics and things, they're very protective right. of, their, of their situation because the rest of the non-technical staff do not know how little they actually do right. and how much they're being paid to do that very little. And they're very afraid of that getting out. So they're very resistant to new outside people coming in. So when you're launching these kind of things and selling to, who are you selling to and what, what kind of obstacles do you have? Right. At the time, that was top executives at grocery companies, right? And I think the way I sell, and there's a million different ways to sell. But the way I like to sell is like make it so transparent that this is the best thing possible, that if their, you know, their senior person at the company saw they didn't take it, like they're getting the ax. <laughs> you have to push it that hard. Okay. Like I can track these ads, I know better. And uh, you know, as we get up to speed too with Acquire now, so it's my marketing agency now, uh, it's like I'll do head-to-heads against other agencies. It's like I know I have the best numbers. Your job is to pick the provider with the best numbers, right? I have the best cost. Like lay it out in such a way that there is no way to escape it. And then if your solution isn't the best possible way, it's like time to rethink your solution. Absolutely. So before private, uh, yeah, you know, you started to acquire recently. So before acquired, um, yeah. between 2015 Groupon and till now, what, what was the Yeah, so there? left Groupon and I think at that time, like... Oh, was there a reason for that? So uh, they, the project was sort of moving on. Yeah. Uh, and sort of Groupon was pivoting what they were doing. Before they were in a big expansion mode, they sort of started to focus more on, yeah. on core offerings. more niche. Uh, I was thought I was like God's gift to tech. I, I was so sure I was like the hot shit and it was going to keep working. And I struggled for like four years after that. Okay. So I launched a soap company with some friends so uh, that, that actually crushed it. So what, in the second month. What company was it? Uh, it was called Pearl Bath Bombs. Pro bath bombs, a yeah. soap company. Soap company. Okay. In uh, the second month, we did 500k in sales. Nice. Uh, using Facebook video ads. Wow. And at that point, I became pretty obsessed with like Facebook video ads and how those work. That's pretty early because no one was really picking up on video ads. That was like right when video ads came out. We spent two thousand dollars to do five hundred thousand dollars in sales. Like wow. that's not going to happen again. Wow. That was a magical time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and yeah, so launch that. Launch that with my best friend and his fiance. Don't do that. <laughs> that's a bad idea. <laughs> yeah. You know, we parted ways amicably at the end, but it was like uh, not the right setup. Yeah, when you're too close sometimes for business, it, it kind of falters, right? Totally. Yeah. Uh, left and then started three companies in a row that failed, like hard. Some of them I did a lot of PR on too <laughs> before they failed. So like family Christmas party, they're still like, how's remote way doing? And I'm like, dude, it never even did. Like it never oh, got man. off the ground. Yeah. I was looking at a berry, like a supplement berry that was an alternative to sugar. was like, I spent so much time planning that one, spent six months planning it. Uh, was about to launch and there was a, a drought in Thailand and the berry became unavailable. Oh no. So just things you can't take uh, control, control of. of yeah. 
uh, went to China, found scooters, found ride sharing, kind of had that ride sharing scooter idea going, and then just so like decided, scooters, like electric scooters, electric scooters, decided not to pull the trigger. Yeah. Uh, third company was remote way, so that was a remote travel group, uh, and remote working, and I think it was sort of a little bit ahead of its time. Yeah. Uh, and you know, a little bit of. Uh, so remote working, like you were in open up co-working spaces? Like what was so the, what was it was there? travel group. And I think okay. what happened during that period too is like beginning of the idea, it was really hard to find travel groups. What was happening throughout the entirety of that idea was like co-working spaces were opening. Like all of the infrastructure is being built. And so to be a tour group is a lot less valuable than it was even in that, it was like an eight month period. So let's break that down. So you wanted it to be a tour group for people who work remotely to Where travel you, together? And you plan all the infrastructure pieces, which eight months before, like super hard to find Wi-Fi in Chile. Yeah. Super hard to find a, a working space. During that eight months, like everywhere there pops up, the yeah. co-working space, the, the hostile co-working space that you can stay at. And it's like, I'm looking at it, you know, myself, I'm like, why would I even pick a tour group now that all these options are here? And it was like, initially when we were planning, we're like, oh great, now there's a place to go, now there's a place to go. Oh wait, this is like Too becoming much. turnkey. Yeah. Uh, so the problem sort of solved itself from a different angle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but what was consistent through all of those uh, failures and like they were tough and failing is, is hard uh, was the marketing wasn't bad right and a lot of people were seeing the marketing and it was working yeah so I think that's where you know something I started thinking a lot more about is momentum and I felt like I totally lost momentum right where you okay it's, like I could have kept going in grocery coupon sales I was 21 and like killing it in grocery coupon sales in terms of how much I was doing like making great money uh, but I got a request for proposal in that area to target single African American mothers in impoverished areas with like sugar water. And I'm like, no, that's it. I'm out. I'm out. I'm out. I'm out. Like, uh, I'm going to ride this out. And I'm not saying in, in grocery coupon sales, I'm not saying in the grocery world, like, there's so much nastiness in CPG when you know these are unhealthy products and you're looking like, they're, this is who they want me to target. This is where this industry is going. I'm not going to be a part of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, then on e-commerce and like having a couple e-commerce bumps and then travel group. And I'm like, where do I go from here? Uh, and I think it's so important to build momentum. Like Michelle Romano to me is the biggest inspiration in terms of momentum. Yeah. She rolls wins together like you wouldn't believe. Like one thing works. Okay, it's the next thing. Okay, now she's getting on Dragon's Den. Now she's launching her company. Now Dragon's Den's going to support it. Now ClearBank is like a unicorn now. <laughs> like, yeah. All of these things keep happening. So she does a great job of building momentum. And I think when you look at starting in different areas, or I see startup founders like really popping around everywhere, uh, you lose a lot of the momentum there. And then you can feel really stuck because you're basically starting from scratch again. And that's because you have to learn a completely new industry and all that. Totally. So yeah. I was like totally at the end of that period of those three startups in a place where I'm like, I have no momentum. I'm done. What am I going to do? Uh, and people started just asking me for help with marketing. And so I was helping people, sort of training them. Eventually, I was doing enough. I'm like, I got to get paid. This isn't fun anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm getting paid. And I'm sitting there like in a room every single day against a whiteboard, just like writing ideas out. And at this point, there's not like a new startup idea that I see. I've spent like through those four years of, or three years of failing through that period, I spent like almost every day thinking of startup ideas, researching startup ideas, writing them out. Uh, and so as I'm like, going against whiteboard, like trying to write out startup ideas, I keep, my time keeps getting filled from being at the whiteboard with helping people with their marketing and their companies becoming really successful and them referring their friends and they're becoming more work than I can do. And I'm like, I have to put that to the side so that I can focus on figuring out my next startup, figuring it out. And I'm like, oh shit, it's, it's here. Right? Yeah. It's like people want to actually pay me to do something and I'm good at it. And like we've taken companies and six X their revenue in a month. Like, yeah. uh, it's been extremely helpful for them. So that's how you started. Like you start consulting with companies first. Started consulting, and then actually Michelle's partner was like, "You got to launch an agency." I'm like, "I don't want to launch an agency." So we set up with the company a bet: uh, if I could double their business in a month, they would give us equity in the company, and like won the bet. So I'm like, "Okay, I'll launch the agency." I'll do it. I'll do <laughs> so you got it. dragged into it. <laughs> exactly. I did not want to launch an agency at all. <laughs> I fought it tooth and nail. I think being an entrepreneur, like starting an agency or like a consulting service, it's kind of like it's kind of a sidestep. It's right? a sidestep. It seems like a professional service totally. rather than an entrepreneurial venture. Totally. Right? No, I mean, it's for the first like four months, I was so funny because all these other startups, I was like so far behind and like, this is my baby. This is my thing. Yeah. I'm going to push it. It's not working at all, but I'm like pushing it, pushing it. And this is the first business I've had 
where the momentum of it's so much greater. I feel like I'm like running downhill from it and it's coming behind me because yep. it's growing faster than I can keep up with. Uh, and so, you know, initially it is, a, it, it does look like a sidestep for sure. And it's not the same as working on that. You know, we all sort of have our tech dream of like the most technically advanced, but consumer facing project there is out there. Uh, and so I've learned through the agency, you know, it's, it's not what you're doing, it's how you're doing it in a lot of ways. I knew the issues with agencies out there and my job is to like be the agency that isn't something that I would look down upon. Yep. Uh, and we do that through, again, attribution and tracking, mm -hmm. uh, where we do, everything we do is tracked. We measure everything we do, <clears throat> sorry, in terms of bottom level sales. So we're looking at the bottom funnel. We're measuring on sales, app downloads, it can be sometimes lead gen, but really measuring all the way and not giving ourselves any room out and not giving, you know, like for the client, like the top thing on our report has to be sales driven. If we don't hit the number, like we'll go to them and say we miss the sales number, but yeah. that's entirely the focus. So I first heard of um, uh, Acquire Agency from Axel. Yep. Shout out to the stage keep. Awesome. Um, and first thing when you pop up, you say we drive sales. Yep. Um, you're an ad agency and you're talking about sales. And that, that really kind of got to me right away. That I'm like, no ad agency talks about that. Right. They talk about you know, cost per acquisition, they're like, there's cost numbers. Cost per impressions, oh, we're gonna show you this many people. Oh, we're gonna have earned media. Oh, we're gonna have like, fuck it. It doesn't yeah. matter, yeah. are you driving sales or not? Yeah. Right, like, uh, line I use is like, you can't buy inventory with clicks. Yeah. <laughs> right. You can't buy, you know, you can't pay your staff with engagement. Like, mm -hmm. drive sales, put money in the bank account. We know we can track it. It's time for every agency to step up and like acknowledge that. It's time for marketing individuals to acknowledge that. Yeah. We can do it. We need to stop pretending we can't. Mm -hmm. like we know we can track the sales that we drive. So how is it that you drive sales? So you run the marketing campaign, but you track the campaign and you track the conversion? So we're tracking the campaigns, tracking the conversions, uh, and then not sidestepping it ever is a big piece there. Uh, in terms of the way we're doing it, so we're video first, so we're a 90% video agency. Oh, okay. So we've been iterating a lot and really pushing forward the video styles. Like now we're a Facebook preferred partner. So in 18 months, we've grown to one of the top 40 agencies in North America wow. for Facebook. Yeah. Uh, we work with their team, like with the video styles, they're watching what we're doing to constantly iterate uh, on, the, on the video style. So using that to target consumers, drive them to the site, track everything in sales. If we're not tracking it, not doing it. Uh, and that's where we know like we're the best in that at that space. We do head to heads against other agencies where we literally like, here you take 50k, we'll take 50k. Let's drive it. Let's see who wins. So what do you mean you co-invest in? Them? So no, we'll, we'll like literally do like, we'll challenge other agencies to split the budget on an account and see who can drive more sales because we can track both sides. So oh, okay, so you bring in competitors. Into so if there's another competitor on the account, if usually, there is. <laughs> usually okay. when there's another one, usually okay, we, don't, okay. we don't ask to come in. But like for our clients, we're open to it. They're yeah. like, oh, we have this other agency we're interested in. Like, cool, segment, like an awesome budget. Let's see who wins. We're confident we're going to be the top performing agency. That's uh, very that's very aggressive, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I have to rate that. Um, have you ever lost? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Great. How many campaigns have you run? Uh, in terms of head to heads, we've done like ten of those. Okay. Uh, in terms of clients, there's like over 50 in terms of campaigns, like right now there's over 20,000 ads live. So okay, okay. is it time to um, What's the minimum ad buy-in? Uh, minimum monthly budget. So we work with companies on a really high scale where we're spending a million a month, uh, but we also work with companies on a much lower level. So through Michelle and like kicking back to entrepreneurs, we'll take companies who are spending $4,000 in the first month. Okay. Uh, much lower than other agencies will, but we've helped some of those companies really significantly scale. Okay. Where some of those companies are now spending like 200K a month. So we like to home grow some of our clients. So you grow your clients and help Absolutely. drive them to the sales, the conversions, so they can afford you better. Absolutely. Better, yeah. I mean, that's, that's how it should be. Yeah. Right? I mean, marketing agencies usually don't care about sales. They're like, no, we're about your brand. Absolutely. Right? We're about getting your presence known. You take care of the conversion and the sales, right? We'll send you the traffic your way. So that kind of ownership really, uh, it's really different. Um, so when, let's go back to the videos, right? You do, you're completely video focused. Totally video isn't that, focused. Isn't that very capital intensive? Like uh, it can be. Resource there's, intensive. There's ways to shoot affordably. Like okay. you guys have a beautiful setup, but yeah. you, you can pull it back a bit, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, in terms of, of that, like that is what the industry is becoming. A lot of agencies are following us there, uh, but we've had that in since the beginning, and that's because I saw that success with video ads, and I'm just like. Oh, they're better. Yep. And even today, 
you know, a lot of agencies are using images because video is hard to make. Yeah. Video is the best. Video is the way, way, it's to, way go, to go. Right? It's not just people are like, why is video the best? It's like, because it's a better medium because mm -hmm. you can communicate more. You can get more messaging across. Okay. So, you are on our terrible website. So I think <laughs> another thing to note about the way we've sort of grown is with this business, it's been uh, highly based on referrals. Yeah. So my other businesses, when I launched them, this was a big lesson. Uh, I would be like, here's the idea. Okay, I'm going to go talk about this as much as possible, and then I'll fix the service. Yeah. I flipped that mentality now, and this is like so rare. We didn't have a website for our first six months. We were growing extremely rapidly without a website. Because we focus entirely on the service and <laughs> not like, on ourselves. So uh, this, that's, a, that's, a, that's a really good play. Yeah. I mean, that's a really hard play being in, in a tech industry. Well, also being a marketing firm. And people marketing really, firm, too, and not having any marketing for yourself. <laughs> don't have marketing for yourself. Uh, but it's the cobbler who has holes in his shoes because he's so, you know, we're focused on our clients' work and focused on providing the best service, yeah. especially in the services industry. Like, that's going to speak for itself. But I think a, there's so much guruism happening. There's so much, I want to be out there, I want to be press first, like focus on your service. Yep. Offer the best possible service and that will grow your business. And so there's an overhaul of the website coming. This is my first sort of like PR thing I'm doing on the business. Absolutely, talking I mean, about it. this thing, this looks completely like a, like a startup, which you kind of, kind of are, kind of but are. you're uh, aggressively growing. Yeah, we've grown to a 20 person mm -hmm. team in 18 months and we'll probably be 40 before the end of the year. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's been a... Uh, Definitely, and this is your partner up here, Sam? My partner, Sam. Sam, yeah, absolutely. And Michelle Romanoff over here. Michelle. And Andrew. Andy. Yeah, so we've got, uh, we've got quite the team here. Got quite the team. I have an awesome team. It's been great. Yeah, Axel's uh, over here. <laughs> yeah, Axel's on there. And shout out to Daniel for uh, introducing us. Yeah, that's great. Oh, Daniel, a collision. Uh, yeah, it's been great putting this team together. Sam, I actually met in philosophy mm -hmm. uh, at Queens, which is funny how that comes around. He was working yep. consulting and we came back together. Uh, we both sat in the back of philosophy classes, not taking notes. Yep. The difference was I was like, getting D's and he was getting top A's in the class. I mean, aren't those the entrepreneurs, the exactly. D's that sit in the back? <laughs> exactly. So Sam, uh, I think it's really powerful to have people in different areas on the team. Uh, so I get to be sort of creative and leading the future and moving the next thing a little bit more disorganized and Sam's holding it all down. Yeah, uh, more operational focus. Like operational. What's and going on right now? He crushes it and like, he runs the company for the most part. And uh, It's great to have that dynamic and I think I've worked with people in the past too who had the exact, like almost entirely the exact Venn diagram overlay. It's great to have someone who's got a different Venn diagram overlay who can cover that area. Absolutely. So you create all the videos for your clients in-house yourselves? In-house, yeah. Um, I mean, that takes a lot of creative uh, acumen, right? Um, how do you scope that out, what they need and what they want and what their brand is? Right. We don't, we call it the B word. So we try to push companies back on brand. Okay. Everyone's way too focused on brand. Yep. No one gives a fuck about your brand. Yep. Like, brand no to one dying. cares. Brand to dying, yeah. Right? Uh, it, if you're Nike, yeah, but no one's seen your logo before. No one knows that. It's like focus on the product. Yeah. Literally simplify it down to, you know, what is the product doing? Mm -hmm. Show people what the product is doing. That's what like 80% of advertising for startups should be because you have something new. Yeah. So if you're trying to focus on the artistic and the brand, it's like, no one knows what you're talking about. Just show them what you're talking about. So sort of simplifying some of that thought process there is important. Uh, and then in terms of having the creative acumen, it's, you know, I think our creative acumen is like, how do we do it affordably? Yeah. And how do we shoot in a way where it's affordable? And how do we shoot in a way where this is a very different industry? And sort of the thing we understand that I think a lot of the other agencies don't is that a shoot shouldn't come out with two videos. It should come out with 100. Mm -hmm. Like, you need to give yourself room to be wrong. Yeah. So, we have the ability to launch a ton of ads now. Yeah. The idea shouldn't be to try to sit there and brainstorm until you get that one ad that's going to be right and come out with one edit. That's what 99.99999% of the market does. It's like, we're going to come out with one and we're so fucking smart that we're going to sit here and we're going to figure out what that is. Yeah. I, I don't agree with that. Like, I, I mean, that's the 90s model of what like, um, ads was, right? You sit in a room, right? You map out all these ideas and what your brand's going to be. You don't do that anymore. No, no, this is a test, test, yeah. test. Like, get different possibilities of what could work, okay, and then come out with 10, 20 videos from the first shoot. So how do you scope it out? Do you scope it out by target market, or do you scope about, focus it by... So it depends. Use case, target market, explainer. I mean, we have, like, 20 different video templates we want to plug into. We're optimizing on, like, what those templates are. And when we're shooting, it's, like, get the footage that could fit into as much of these different areas as possible, nice. and then testing the different templates, and... 
you know, there's so much that you can test and that's overall, that's one of the more overwhelming things. It's not how many things, like it's, it, it's not coming up with tests, it's limiting yourself in your tests. So picking templates, understanding what's working and trying to get learnings across clients is really important. And you know, this is, uh, I think this is relevant to every startup that I'm talking about Absolutely. too. If you're not in marketing, like if you're like, oh, I'm in SaaS, like it we do marketing yeah. and sales. So this applies the same way. I'm taking sales principles almost and bringing them to marketing. Like your sales pitch, right? You should have like 10 iterations and like for 10 different, iterations and yeah. then you're a b testing and you're testing it against different clients and you have to have the ability to learn i mean this is different this is startup philosophy right startup absolutely. philosophy is entrepreneurship but broken down into testable components absolutely um and that's what i feel right so i mean every part of your business every part, stream should be broken on a component that can be tested to see if you're going the right way if you're building the right way if they if your target market is actually your target market right. if your product is actually the mar product you can be selling right um, and I completely agree. Uh, so you're pretty much breaking down these uh, these companies' needs in, in in the startup philosophy kind of way and force them to be uh, to the test, and you do it for them. And we do it for them. So we run it, the ads as as a client. Uh, we do yeah all the video creation, the ads management, and then like some strategy work with them where we help them figure out what to do while they're rapidly scaling when that's the case. But we are really niche focused too, and I think that's another thing that makes us different. And Another thing I've learned from these startups I tried to launch where I took on way too much. Yeah. That's an easy way to fail. Yeah. And I think... So yeah, do you ever say no to a startup or is oh, a company? I say no like half the, time. Yeah. half the time. And Even I though also, they have the money to pay you, you say no? Yep. And I also go back to companies. I build like a marketing finance model because I know a lot of companies aren't doing enough of that. And wow, okay. Because I sucked. It's like when you suck at something, work until you're really good at it. So I've yeah. worked until I'm good at marketing finance from the first financial model I made that sucked and realizing how important that is. And I'll come back with a marketing finance model for them. And sometimes it comes back and it's like, your startup doesn't work. Like, you're going to fail. It's time to wrap it up. And I'll come back to companies and say that or say, like, here's why Facebook won't work for you. But mm -hmm. if I'm not going to make it work on Facebook, you're kind of doomed. Uh, you need to think about these different parts of your business because like, you had an initial bump from PMR. That's probably not going to happen again. You're an initial bump from something. This isn't going to work. Yeah. And that's a really tough conversation to have. And yeah. I think I wouldn't be able to have that if I hadn't spent time where I spent so much time working on businesses that didn't work out in the end. And I'm like, the best thing that could have happened through some of those businesses is like, someone could have come to me and said, there's going to be a job in Thailand, work on the next thing. You would have saved a ton of my time and sort of desire and yeah. like love that I gave out to a product that I could never launch. So I try to bring that back to entrepreneurs and say, okay, this doesn't matter. It's a failure that scar you, that uh, gives you lessons and you phrase your life around. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And this is drug proof, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and the other thing that we focus on is super niche. Like, we're Facebook ads. So there's the majority of agencies would say, oh, we are digital. You want to focus on Facebook and Instagram. Facebook and Instagram ads. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, when I say Facebook, I mean Facebook and Instagram and yeah. everything you can buy through there. But so many agencies are, oh, we're digital. Like, what does that mean? We're running AdWords, email marketing, like, Content, automation, like everything, everything, and we're your DSP too. Like, how can you be good at all those things? Yeah. I think when you think of starting a company, simplify it. So you you feel like you're the only solution these companies are coming to, or should they come to you for this sole reason and go to other companies for the traditional or the other? So companies? we have partners we work with for the, the different areas. For most innovative startups, so you're not a one stop company. You should the companies be one stop shop for you. Or not a one stop shop. And no, I think like uh, Facebook and Instagram ads should not be the ones that bought that shop. That company right. should still be going out to the silos. Just yeah. not with you. Absolutely. Yeah. You should be doing everything with the person who's the best in every, in every space. Okay, okay. Uh, you got to focus on the other areas. And like, we have companies scale in radical ways. And it's funny when we have that happen pretty fairly frequently. We, got, we get to see what are the issues that can happen when we scale. And we try to support companies through that. And one of the first things that can happen when you get a company graphically scaling through Facebook ads is they stop doing everything else. Yeah. And then it's like, wait two months and the Facebook ads stop working because you stop doing everything else. It's that momentum thing. Yeah. When you get one thing working, keep firing all the other channels you're on. Uh, and keep building momentum from there. Yeah. Uh, one of the things we've seen these uh, agency professional services do, like dev shops, um, uh, you name it, right? Like lawyers, accountants, right? Um, they'll, after they get a certain level of success or a few clientele, they start hedging their bets, right? I mean, would you ever consider that strategy of like, okay, these startups are already out here, they're very beginner stage, but they're interesting, we'll co-invest with you, I mean, we'll take care of the ad spend, 
put together a little equity, right? And when you guys make enough money to get the capital, we'll let it out at a higher return than you would have with your payments. Right. So I tried a lot of different charging models when I was in that in-between sort of consulting stage. Yeah. And I did some consulting for those four years. I tried that model. I tried uh, I tried percentage of ads and that sucks. I tried commission only. That doesn't work. Like the model I have for charging now makes a lot of sense. The issue with those funky relationships, and you see so many of them, is it becomes really unclear who the client is and who the boss is and who's doing what for who. And I don't recommend those. Like first off, as a service provider, even when these companies succeed, the idea that they're going to one day be liquid, yeah. right? That they're going to have an exit or they're going to have an IPO. Like it's almost no startups that do that. Uh, and then the next piece is. Uh, you want the control to be with the client for the most part. Like, someone needs to be the boss. If you give me equity in your company to run the marketing, okay, I need that equity to return. I'm going to run marketing the way I want to market. CEO doesn't like my way of running marketing. Dude, I got equity. Like, I'm going to do it that way. And you end up in places where you have a standoff that you can't get around, and it can create nasty situations. So I would say, like, keep it simple. But pay your solutions provider. They provide the service. When you start to do these equity deals, and maybe I'd love to hear if you have a counter argument there. Yeah. Uh, but when I've seen these equity deals, you reach an impasse where you have a disagreement, you have equity in the company. Now, like when you have equity in a company together, you're tied, you're hand you handcuffed yourselves to each other. Now we have a disagreement, oh, that's not on brand, uh, this is the best thing for performance, like it's done. First, my clients are like, I don't like that for my brand. I'm like, no, that's here's, the, here's the three reasons why I disagree. Yeah. You hear my argument, you don't want to move forward with my argument, cool, we can do it. Oh, it didn't work. Yeah, I guess it's different for your industry, whether like lawyers, accountants, and professional services in that, that industry, or even dev shops, they have a fixed term of work. Right. Uh, okay, we'll do this for you for X amount of time. If nothing came out of it, we'll uh, really wipe it out on our balance sheet. Whereas for you guys, yeah, yeah I guess you're actively doing work, right? Oh, dude, we are responsible like every month to be driving growth. So we can have, you know what happens after the best month ever? The next best month ever, right? So it's constant, it's ongoing. Uh, so we're, we're always working alongside that. But even if you're a professional services person and watching, like, rebuild your model on what percentage of startups are successful. Yeah. Right? It's so few. It's so few. And the levels at which are successful. Like, I think it's, uh, it's a really, really risky bet from a service provider. And, you know, I think you have to think about bringing in cash as a service provider so that you can hire the team that can provide the best possible service and you owe it to your clients to do that. Yeah. So I focus on what you're good at, right? Uh, delegate what you're not. Right. And don't do a half-ass job for equity. Yeah. Okay, it's an interesting kind of argument. Because um, I've been talking with a few different industries about that. I'm not first talking to someone on the marketing side. And that's a valid point. Um, okay, so uh, quite easy. How long have you been operating again? So it's been 18 months. 18 months. Uh, we've grown to a 20-person team. We're hiring really quickly. We're probably going to be 40 before the end of the year. Who are you hiring? Uh, we are hiring, so we got a position for anyone who's Sort of coming out of school, wants to learn the background of, of marketing and tech, like we can give that background to an account coordinator, data analyst, uh, we're always hiring editors and people on the, the production side. The production side. Yeah. Um, now, for the production, would you ever see in the future where you, you outsource the production? No. No, so that's that's the industry standard that is switching now, where people are starting to bring that tech in house. Yeah. Uh, for us, the production and the data piece go hand in hand, right? So the production team is like super aware of the data of the way their ads perform. Outsourcing production, that's a team who sort of does it and the, the finished product is their deliverable. The deliverable for a production team is drive sales. Yeah. So if they make a video that doesn't drive sales, it's not done yet. What's interesting is like, you're kind of offering almost like, almost like a hedge fund would uh, describe when it comes to video production, right? There's asset classes that you're creating and testing, right? right? And, and uh, templating, right? Um, that's really interesting. Um, I see that more that algorithmic, uh, algorithmic um, coordinated kind of uh, aspect to like business to be the norm. And is that coming from, I think it's coming more from the programming tech kind of world, right? Absolutely. Where it's like everything's more tested and field tested and like broken out of components totally. that are then also tested, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of people from production, they initially hear that, like they hate that. Oh yeah. They hate it. Because then you're, you're taking data and giving it, making um, creators follow that. Structure. Totally. They're like, I'm creative, I don't want the data. And you're like, got it backwards. If you want to show you're really creative, win within the data. Because yeah. now you can prove you're creative because the, the history of being creative has been 
oh, do these 10 guys in a boardroom enjoy what I'm doing? Yeah, yeah. And the great thing is now it doesn't matter if the sun guys like it. Like it doesn't matter. This this sort of democratizes creative in terms of who whoever it is who makes the best one that is tracked and, and it works it's great. Like I had videos, my creative team brings me, they go, I hate that. Yeah. And they're like, cool, I really want to stand by it. Launch it. And I'm wrong sometimes, right? right? And so they're right, I'm wrong, like, cool. You've sort of earned a stripe. The stripe doesn't matter because the data is not matter. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it's all about being creative enough to make the data show that it works, and it shouldn't be restricted. Like you can't, it doesn't mean you can't have fun. Yeah. It doesn't mean you can't think of a creative idea. It just means like you have to test, it. test it and do it within you know the bounds to be able to show the results, and then you can really merit your you know you can show your merits. Oh, this video that we did was an improvement to such a tune that it drove half a million dollars in profit. How much is our next shoot worth? Half a million. Million dollars profit, <laughs> right? Yeah. So give me 200k. Like you want to set up your budgets rapidly. Yeah. Uh, do something that's tracked. Yeah. It's a super interesting business because you're pretty much funding the companies to pay you more. Right. Right. That's very, That's the place you want to. That's exactly what that's we the do. Place no. you be. It's like we are literally exactly growing the companies. We charge on uh, flat fee plus commission model. And like they, when we don't do a great job, our invoices don't get paid. Right. And companies can go under, so we are totally responsible for growing our companies, and like the health of our clients is dependent on how good are the ads that we run. So I come from a background where I mean, what I really specialize in is like face-to-face -face handshake, right, right? Uh, and make deals, right? These really work great for like um, like B two B businesses, the uh, enterprise businesses. We see that changing, um, where uh, you can source to, away, away from that kind of personalized interactions. So I think. Where you can, in the B2B business, you know, we think about funnels a lot. We think about top funnel, mid funnel, bottom funnel. To explain what that is, top funnel is your first impression, no one's ever seen you before. Middle funnel is when someone's like been to your website and hasn't purchased. Bottom funnel is when someone's like added to cart. In terms of, of that, like top funnel, yes, for, for B2B that can change. But that's a shit job. Like, I don't know, maybe you like it. I think being a dialer is, is pretty brutal. So if advertising can help get them in the room, that's going to help. But you still got to have the personality. The closing, I think you got to bring that personality up. And I work with the companies I work with, I'm always like, bring the human element up. Yeah. And they want to go, oh, it's automation, it's all this. Like, no, we custom write every piece of the ad copy that comes out for the audience it's going out for. Reply to every single comment, but re like, leave your rep replies in the B2C world. In the B2B world, like, you better have a phone number and you better be good when you answer the phone. Yeah, yeah. So essentially, the marketing funnel leads into the sales funnel, right? Absolutely. Um, cool. I mean, and in the sales funnel, like the personal relationships are are still there. It's just as important. You just are probably changing the way you're sourcing your leads. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Um, I, I can definitely see that being success because now it is, it's really hard to get people in the same room with you because right. there's so much noise, right? So you, you pretty much do that. You drive people to get a reason for that um, the conversion to make to take place, right? And, and that's a good spot to get to. But then you see people go, oh, and then the chat box takes over, and you're like, uh. No, if you're trying to get them to use a service. So chatbots, I mean, Facebook made a big noise about this two or three years ago. Everyone made a big noise about building chatbots. Where do you see that? Have you said market funnel at all? No, I think they're transparent and like people don't want to, to, to do that. Like there, there's unique cases for it on high value things that are focused, like SaaS, some SaaS products where it's more, the chatbot replaces the FAQ. Yeah. The chatbot does not replace the salesperson. And I feel like sales are getting worse, like that. not better. Like, they're dropping all personality, they're dropping all ability to address problems and like, please don't have a sales call with me where you go, okay, now I'm going to start the video conference link and read to me for 45 minutes. Like, so you put me on video calls so I can't even be doing something else right now. <laughs> if you're going to like, read me to a slide, I can read a fucking deck. Like, yeah. Ask me about my business, right? This, this is how you should do it. Ask me about my business, figure out what my problems are, create a solution that makes sense for me and explain how your system can plug in. I, SaaS sales, I think, is like, uh, what I'm seeing is, is bad right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've noticed that too. A lot of people are very aggressive about getting a call, get a call, get a call with me. The call comes and it's very, uh, not even aggressive, it's very, very blunt. Right. There's no human interaction to it. And it's monotone and it's reading off the slide and like, I just have some fun on a sales call. Like, be a little bit controversial, make some jokes and address something in the business and build a relationship. Like that video call should not be pulled out until I've got my team in the room to evaluate whether it's a good solution or not. Like do not bring that in on the opening call with me, please. Yeah. So I want to dive into what's next for you, right? Um, I mean, is, uh, 
acquire going to be acquired? Or is that, or <laughs> are you going to turn into a passive income stream where you go and build the company that you want to build? Right. So, you know, for me, I think momentum is that thing I'm talking about, right? What do, what do I have? And it's so easy to start to, to worry so much about what's three years or five years out. And entrepreneurs lose a lot of sleep over those decisions. Like, what am I going to do with the choir? I'm going to build enough momentum that either of those things can happen. And then I'm going to build enough momentum that, like, can it be on its own where I don't have to be as day to day involved? And then if I'm starting to launch products or other services, but probably products, uh, I so will use the, the, the best marketing team out there. Yeah. And I'm going to have it, right? So That's amazing. So I'm assuming that you learned that for sure and off the Dragon's Den. Dragon's Den folks really do that really well. They create ecosystems for themselves. Right. Each business kind of feeds into something else they're doing and something they want to be doing. Absolutely. And I think the other thing we have with Acquire is you got to be seeing real world problems. Like you got to see what is happening out there. And we're extremely close to it every day. We see every issue that all of our clients have. So in terms of what's the next big SaaS solution, like someone needs to build an automated tool that does LTV tracking for subscription box companies. Like I know that because all my clients have that issue. Yeah. Uh, so I'm so close to issues that, you know, in terms of developing that SaaS tool, I know it's really out there. So I love having a company now that puts me close to the problems and has a lot of momentum on it. Cool. Um, all right. So do you have any idea? Like, so we have like a, a timeline for when Acquire you think you're running by itself where you go and focus on other businesses? I would probably give it another two years. Yeah. Another two years before before it does. Uh, I don't see it entirely distinct though. Like where I can be heavily involved in that area and then launch other things through it, right? Like when I look at what's the most important part of an e-commerce or an app download business is like the acquisition part. Yeah. Where would I be focused as a founder of the acquisition part? I actually just need to hire the other girls. Okay. So I can still be focused on acquiring and launching other businesses at the same time. So you can see that as like finding out um, the great companies you want to work with. Like you want to find other companies that are doing great because it's hard to hire someone to run your vision. It's right? very hard. Right? It's, better, it's easier to find someone with a great vision and give them the tools that's required to build that, build that, uh, build it up. Is that what's next for you? I think I can. You want to be a dragon? I can carry some of the vision. I yeah, the dragon thing. Eventually, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Michelle already got the youngest one, so we'll, we'll see. We'll see what I can do next. Uh, but for me to have a tool that I can accelerate things out of. Uh, I can carry the vision piece through it, right? And I can bring the operational pieces in. If you can figure out acquisition and think about acquisition, this is where I get in trouble when I try to start companies, is I think about acquisition first. And really, you gotta think about product first. And so I think focusing on the product piece, but uh, what that future holds we're gonna figure out. For now, it's like, how am I a 100-person agency within a year from today? Okay, Michael, man, this is great. It's really been eye-opening into the industry and what you're trying to do as well. Um, really happy you came on. Perfect. That's All right. right. All right. Thanks for my time. Thanks, guys. Okay, good.